you know, what I want to know is is how how does one get involved in doing rock work as a woman? Do you really, really want to know? Or do you just want the rehearsed response that I always give? What would happen if we chose to really tell the truth about ourselves? Like if we really, really just told the real truth of our lives. I'm not saying that it's true. I'm saying that it's my truth. You're listening to him. When I had moved to Black Mountain in the year 2000 and opened my garden shop called the Enchanted Garden, I had painted on this uh, upper corner wall, kind of like near the ceiling. Uh, There was a, a little space about a foot between the trim and the ceiling and I had painted in this kind of gold leaf, kind of fairy tale-ish type uh, font. Not not really old English, but sort of, I don't know, leaning that direction. And um, I had put uh, dot, 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 and they lived happily ever after. And I had actually gone into a house in Atlanta uh, way back in my landscaping days, one of my clients, and she was a really cool woman, and they had this just gorgeous house and buckhead and... Uh, she would always invite me in the foyer, you know, if she was going to write me a check or pay me or whatever. And I remember I came in one time and I looked up and I saw this uh, lettering, like stenciling, and but it was very classy. It wasn't tacky. It wasn't like a Michaels kind of thing. It looked very uh, kind of old and European looking and it really stuck out to me. And so That sort of uh, gave me the idea when I had opened my shop, I wanted it to be very enchanted, and it was, Um, but I think that there was something inside of me that truly believed in that fairy tale. As, you know, as ridiculous as it sounds, I think there was a small little part of me that still believed that you could live happily ever after. And I think that's why I had kind of, you know, affirmed that on that wall. And now here it was, you know, flash forward 22 years later. 22 years. I mean, it's so crazy to me at how quickly my time has flown by in Asheville, North Carolina. But, you know, here I was in this almost like a fairy tale, and they lived happily ever after. And I was starting to really believe and love my new life and my new future that was starting to form. And I got a text about 3.15 one morning, and it was it was Helen, Helen of Greece, and she said, babe, I don't have enough people. I don't have enough workers. And, and so I text back. And I said, how many more do you need? And she said about 20. But she said that the um, what had happened was that the protocol, the COVID protocol had really affected uh, the workforce, you know, at the vineyard and all over the country. And really, she said people were pretty scared in Greece because of what had happened in Italy. And she was very frustrated, though, because now she has all these, uh, how she has housing 
And she sent me pictures of this housing where the workers stay. She called them squatters. I'm like, what's a squatter? I'm always thinking like a crack house. But she sent this picture and it looked like a dang resort. But she said, you know, her dad had built all this housing and everything. But over the years, you know, there were plumbing issues and electrical issues. And basically, she'd gone back over to kind of get everything up to speed. And she said that day she was traveling to go uh, visit this Chinese company that worked on uh, winery equipment and that there was a lot of rust in some of these heavy machinery. You know, some there was rust and there were the rodents had uh, eaten through a lot of the wiring. But she just said there was so much and it was kind of overwhelming. And she had taken this on and basically it was her. You know, her sister lived in London but was there for the holidays but had like five kids and just wasn't really able to, you know, participate. But, but Helen was very... Um, she was a really good leader, and one thing she said that uh, really kind of cracked me up, but I didn't, it took me a minute to understand it, but she said they were trying to keep out the externals, and I'm like, externals? But what she meant was uh, the housing, with the COVID and everything, if a household got covid then she still had to pay them and house them and feed them. And that if they let people come in from the outside, like at night to come hang out or whatever, they were bringing COVID in to the vineyard. And so she was really frustrated with that. But um, everybody was having to test and uh, most mostly were tested negative, but she was really concerned about it. And she just said that, you know, she felt like the government was going to really ruin the country again because people expected really high wages and um, that people had gotten very comfortable not working and being, I guess, pretty much on unemployment, kind of like what was going on here. And I think it was hard for her. And I actually had a dream that she hired a robot. <laughs> I said to her, I said, you know, and then I actually Googled it and they make robots. There are actually robots out in California vineyards uh, that, you know, work in the vineyard. And she laughed. I was like, maybe that's not a bad idea, you know. But I was so intrigued with this whole thing because I had no idea how a vineyard worked or what the whole process was. And and so I'd been kind of, you know, sort of snooping around a little bit. And she told me the name of her new uh, company. She had to create a new company for this Guinness sale. And, and actually, you know, Guinness was o uh, owned by a company, a, like a big umbrella company, Diageo. And that's, I think, the the main company that was sort of buying different vineyards and places all over the world. I mean, this is a huge conglomeration, and we're talking millions and millions of dollars. And so I was just, uh, I didn't want to be too nosy. You know what I mean? I didn't want to ask too many questions, but I was super curious. I mean, why wouldn't I be? And uh, And it was just very intriguing to learn about. And the the largest vineyard in Patras, Greece, is um, was I think it was like Achia Kloss or Achia Kloss, and uh, and I looked that vineyard up and I started reading about it and looked at some of the old photographs of some of the ancestors, you know, the the people. I guess this place had started in the 1800s, and interesting enough. Some of the old black and white photos of the people, they, you know, she sort of favored because, you know, you think of Greek people being like dark hair, dark eyes, dark skin or olive colored skin. But she had very light brown hair and uh, hazel blue eyes. And the people in these photographs, uh, she favored. They had the high cheekbones and the kind of Grecian looking uh nose and kind of this structure, this facial structure that uh, favored her. And so I, I kept thinking, I wonder if that's the vineyard. And if it is, I mean, we're talking like, 
like royalty here. And I kept thinking, you know, maybe that's why she's so um, vague about letting me into this fold, you know, because she's got to be able to trust me. She's not going to just let anybody into her life, you know, with this kind of uh, business and money and all of that. And so I was very um, respectful. I didn't try to dig deep and ask a bunch of questions. I figured, you know, this will unfold as it's supposed to, and I don't have to, to do anything. Uh, just be supportive. And that's kind of what I had been doing. And so I could tell that that she was frustrated about the whole, you know, trying to fix all the stuff. And so that had really um, had been an issue for her with repairs and, and all that. And I, and I told her, I said, look, you know, once again, if you need me and Joey and Wilkes to come over and I mean, these guys are like skilled carpenters and, you know, we can fix stuff, you know, and she laughed and she, she was very appreciative of that. And, um, and then later that day, it was raining here in Asheville and I had built a fire in my fireplace because it was cold and rainy. And I think we just took off work that day. It was just really, usually we work in the rain if it's not too heavy, but it was really coming down and. And so I got a text, and she said, uh, I told my mother about you. And I'm like, really? And then she said, can I call you? And I said, yeah. And so she called, and I said, what would you tell her? And she said, well, she said, I told her what you did. And I went, oh, no. I said, did, did she disapprove? You know, because I'm always thinking like that people judge like if you're like a laborer they think you're like a loser or something you know and and uh, I said let me guess and she goes I'll give you 50 bucks if you can guess you know and I said I bet you she warned you about meeting someone on the internet and she laughed and said ah 50 percent you're 50 percent right on that but um but she said you know I told her that um what you did that you did stonework and you were like a stone artist and that you were like a visionary and and she asked me if I had asked you about my prior relationships and I thought that was an interesting question coming from her mom her mother said you know you can learn a lot about somebody from their prior relationships and Helen told her you know that we hadn't talked that much about you know our exes but then she asked her if she trusted me and Helen said, you know, Mom, she hasn't given me a reason not to. And so um, I sent her a picture of my ragged pants and my boots just from the waist down in front of the fireplace. I said, just don't show her my clothes. And, you know, we were laughing about that. And um, we got to talking about um, the future. And, you know, as I record this and talk about this, I've never shared a love story of my life. I've never shared like intimate details about, you know, getting to know somebody or how a relationship formed. I've told little bits and pieces along the way, but actually I had never had a, a time span. You know, this was like a four month, you know, going into a five month uh, time span of learning about somebody. I had never had this kind of um, depth learning about another individual. Usually it was, you know, in person. And so we talked about uh, what would happen if we, when we really meet. I said, are you nervous? And she says, not so much. And I said, well, I'm a little bit nervous. And I said, but I told her, I said, you know what, Helen? I said, if we meet and there's no chemistry, you know, we got to be honest and we have to be up front with each other and just say, you know, hey, it's not there for me. I said, but nothing. I mean, the thing is, is we'll, we'll have a friendship. If nothing else, we'll have a friendship for life because I really felt like um, I felt very close to this person and I felt like. There was just so much in common, and um, 
I said, no matter what happens, you know. And so we we talked a lot that day on the phone. And she told me that the guy at the uh, that she ran over, he was drunk. He was basically had been drunk, and the timing of it was just crazy. And he just fell off in front of her car. But that he was okay, and that he would be going home. And uh, but she kept saying, Jill, I am so grateful. I am so grateful to God that I did not kill this man and uh you know because she just said you know this deal with guinness was like the biggest thing that had ever happened to her and her family and it was like a dream come true and she was just so afraid and didn't want anything to to you know mess it up and i got it i was like i get this totally and she sent me some pictures of these grapes, you know, the grape vines, and a picture of her cousin and her husband. And I'd never seen grape clusters like this. I guess they were like Merlot grapes and uh, Muscat. I don't know if I say that right, but um, I was getting a whole education, and this was just so interesting to me. And so we had started to. Uh, really began to plan a little bit about where we might live. I mean, I was completely, I had never talked about um, to friends even. My friends were asking me some questions and said, do you think that y'all will, you know, be together? And I said, yeah. Uh, And they, they were like, do you think you'll get married? Sort of laughing. And I said, you know what? I would probably marry her tomorrow because I just had never felt this close to somebody, and um, and marriage was not a thing for me. I I could never. I think deep down you know when there's when you should or shouldn't do that, and I I never believed in it that much. Uh, but I felt like you know if this was something that came up that I would be on board with it, especially if it meant, you know, helping her become a citizen or something. I would totally do that. Um, Whether we were in a relationship or not, I felt like if this was something that would help her uh, to achieve her goal, then I would do that. And because, yeah, I I can sacrifice my, my marriage availability. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, I was never a huge uh, advocate for marriage just because I didn't I didn't believe it would ever happen for one thing for gay people. I just didn't think it would ever happen. And then when it did happen, I still didn't believe it. It was like I was in denial. Like I couldn't really grasp it that that was going to be a real thing. Like I thought they would like pull the rug and, you know, take it back or whatever. But I found myself sort of fantasizing about, you know, marrying this beautiful Greek woman and being taken away. And I had a dream one night and I told her my dream. I said, I was riding on the back of a horse with you and I had my arms around you. And what was interesting about this was I had never um, been involved with a woman that felt like a leader, like she really seemed uh, to operate a lot out of her, her male or masculine energy and her leadership ability. And I really, uh, I really admired that. And I felt, I felt like uh, protected, which sounds so crazy. But it was like, you know, I, I felt like this person would really uh, step in if I needed help. I felt like she would be there for me and I felt like she was capable. Like she was capable of taking care of shit. And that was what was so appealing to me because in my life I had been so, you know, such a rescuer and had always been so codependent and I was always trying to help women and fix them and blah, blah, blah. And it was just sickening. Like it made me sick when I look back over my history and look at some of my relationships and all the time and effort and money and and uh, my soul I had thrown in to try to help another human being to stand up on their own two feet 
And it wasn't my job to do that. And really, it does a person a disservice. It really does a disservice to prop a person up and try to enable them or help them. You know, it's no good. There's there's a fine line between truly helping an individual and to enable an individual. And I think that I had crippled quite a few women along the way in my relationships with by doing everything and by taking care of things and paying and fixing. And I was I was still uh you know, kind of resentful about it. And it was something that I was going to have to work on. It's not their fault. It was my fault. I signed up for every fucking bit of it. And it was time for me to let all that shit go. And, you know, I was just so happy and grateful that I had an opportunity now to move forward in my life. You know, it, and I just turned 60. And it was just this new fresh outlook of, oh my God, you know, if I have 30 years left, because I know I'll probably live a long time, I feel like, because I'm pretty dang healthy, but I thought, God, you know, it can be so uh, different and fun. It's like, you know, we work the kinks out. It takes that long to work the kinks out. Now we can get on with the job of living life. And that's how I really felt. And Helen was on a trajectory to get this done with this deal. And she said, I'm, I want to retire quick. She's like, I don't want to hang around and work for another 10 years. I'm ready to do this in about three. She was looking at around two to three years with this deal that was going to take to, I guess, iron the kinks out and all of that. So with all that being said, we had started to sort of plan this uh, future And she asked me where I'd want to live. And she said, we can live anywhere, babe. And I said, how about Santa Fe? And she'd actually been to Santa Fe. And she said, I love Santa Fe. But, you know, she wanted to be near the water. And uh, and so one morning she sent me a picture of her. And she was out walking by the shore. And it was a kind of a cloudy morning. But behind her were like these huge, you know, formations stone formations and the waves crashing and it was just gorgeous and I was just uh, so intrigued and she told me all about uh, the land and how you know developers had been really approaching her to sell this undeveloped land and she was like there's no way that I would betray my family or my myself You know, she says her goal was to create like an animal sanctuary eventually because we're talking about, you know, 3,300 acres that were just complete uh, tropical, jungly kind of mountainy region. And 2,000 acres were the vineyards, but she had all this undeveloped land, but they wanted to build like golf courses and hotels and all that kind of stuff. And she was like, that's not going to happen. Um, and so I admired her for sticking by that. She called me and said she had had this dream that we were on a ship heading to India. And I'm like, really? And the strangest thing was I had dreamed the same morning that, that I was on this ship and I was looking for her. And so we kept having these like, you know, these in sync dreams and visions it was so interesting and I don't know if if the psyche just lines up when you really get in tune with someone and I asked her I said do you believe in vibrational relationship like and she says yeah absolutely it's like a you know it's like you pick up on someone else's vibration I guess and I've had it happen to me before uh, I mean, I've ha- I had sometimes it happens at work even, you know, when you're working with somebody closely and you kind of get on that same vibrational page, you don't have to do a whole lot of talking. Like that person kind of knows the next thing to do or the next thing to hand you or you hand them. It's just like an instinctual thing. And, um, and so this was, you know, starting to really start to happen with us and, 
So, but the ongoing uh, challenge for Helen was all this repair work that she was having to do. And she said it was really starting to put her behind and, and she was kind of getting frustrated. But, you know, Guinness, this this deal, she was supposed to be able to deliver 10,000 barrels of red wine, you know, by the end of February, early March. And the production, you know, so that was the big push. And she was going to end up having to stay over there longer than she thought. She thought she'd be over there like maybe two or three weeks, but now it was pushing into a month. And I said, well, you know, when do you think you'll be back? And she was like, you know, I don't know, babe. She said she might have to fly back like a week and then turn around and go back. And she was even going to leave the dog over there instead of, you know, bringing chill all the way back and then turning around and having to go back. Um, so during this time period, there was just a lot of um, decision making. But also she was really... Uh, enjoying being with her family and her mom and she got sick again and uh i ended up sending her picture to steve over at the harmonic egg because he could actually put your picture in the egg and do like sound vibrational healing and i said hey man i said can you put helen of greece in the egg and he was like, sure. So I sent, you know, I texted him a picture of her and he printed it out, put it in the egg. And, uh, and then my friend, my other friend, my artist friend that's really tapped into the outer ethers of the universe, she did some candles and some, you know, rituals around it. And by God, the next morning she texted me and said, babe, I'm so much better. And I really thought it sounded like she had COVID. And uh, but her mom had made up all these like roots and her mother was a, a healer and an acupuncturist and a massage person. She was really tapped in. And so she was very lucky to have a mother that could like mother her while she was there. And uh, her mother's name was Melissa. And so I sent her Greg Allman or the Allman Brothers song, Melissa, and I said, play this for your mom. And she said her mother loved the song and uh, and that was another thing that was happening was um, all these songs. And I'd sent this, uh, I finally started making a playlist, you know. It was like, I'm going to make a playlist of all the songs that we have sent back and forth to each other. And uh, there was this one particular song that... Um, and I can't, I, I can't even remember the name, but it just kind of popped up on on my li on my suggestion list, and um, it was about getting it right this time. And I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's. Uh, I think for me, I felt like I had so many failed relationships in my life, and I was kind of scared, you know. Because I I didn't want to mess it up. And I felt like, you know, when we meet, when we finally meet in person, you know, wonder if she doesn't like me or wonder if she doesn't feel connection to me. Or, or it could go the other way. I might not feel connection to her. So I was kind of scared because we had built such a such a uh, presence and that was the thing that really got me was her presence and that was what attracted me I think more than anything was was speaking and talking to someone and languaging around presence and open-mindedness and unconditional love and I really felt like Helen of Greece was teaching me about unconditional love because no matter what was going on with her she never was negative. Like, she didn't complain. I mean, even running over the guy, I would have been, like, fucking freaking out. And she she remained, you know, composed. I mean, she was very, very upset. But she was, she remained grateful. And I think across the board, having a, an attitude of appreciation and an attitude of gratitude throughout every day of your life is so key 
in, you know, staying grounded. And uh, also, she wasn't this uh, materialistic. Her her goal was to uh, help her family and her community and then to travel. And maybe that's materialistic. I don't know. But it was really more about having an experience. And that's what I talked to her about. I said, you know, I want to learn how to ride a horse. It's very simple for me. And I just said, you know, I I want to learn about your life. And I said, what's your ultimate goal, Helena Grease? And she laughed and said, actually, you know, she'd like to open a vineyard in the United States. And I'm like, really? I said, well, hell, I'll do all the stonework. And we were like planning it and visualizing it. And she says, we can do anything we want to do. You know, we can go anywhere we want to go. And I said, you know, uh, We could do like a, and she wanted, she had this plan for like outside seating and beautiful terraces and patios and fire pits. And I said, you know, I said, we'll build it to look like ancient Greece, you know, we'll find the the, the right stone. And it was just so much fun to collaborate and create this vision of uh, this whole new world, you know, and it just felt like, um, I couldn't wait and I was having to be patient and I would go to work and I wanted to tell these boys everything and I'd tell them little bits and pieces but you know I was holding back because I didn't want to be so in love and uh, and I think that's really what was happening to me was I felt a hundred percent in love and I felt a hundred percent positive about my future and so it just my uh, my finger bringing the finger back into the 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 story my finger was really giving me some trouble and it was my ring finger on my right hand and so i went down to my friend uh, janet and don's and i'm like y'all you know, Don's a physical therapist, and he looked at it, and he soaked it in paraffin and put a splint and said, I don't think you broke it. I think you just need to splint it. And so I kept trying, you know. I kept keeping the splint and and trying to work with it. But good God, it was just killing me. And I was still trying to work, and I would tape it and, you know, try to uh, protect it when I was working. But it was very, very um, painful. And so we had gone back over, me and the guys had gone back over to uh, Robbie's house, the client who had the, uh, all the tattoos and that had, that had the accident with the explosion. And he wanted to do a, an indoor fireplace. He wanted us to tear out the old uh, mantle and it was this kind of, you know, last afterthought on this house, but we tore all that off of there, and we were going to create this uh, stone-looking uh, fireplace. And he had this piece of art that was so interesting, and it was Jesus. But Jesus looked like he was, like, crawling out of, like, a tomb or something. And I said, why don't we just do it like the tomb? You know, and I don't know if that's sacrilegious or not, but he was real into... Um, religious art and religious artifacts and that kind of thing and so me and the guys came in the house and Robbie had gone out of town and just you know left us a key and we went in and I I had Wilkes and Joey sit on the white leather pit group I said y'all just sit down and we and I had them just stare at the the fireplace opening where we had torn it all out I said I want to guide y'all through a meditation. And so I did a guided meditation with them. And I know they were thinking, oh, what the hell is she doing now? But I wanted us to really get on the same page with using our intuition. Because it's very important when you're doing the creative work that you tap into that place. You can't just grab shit and throw it up there. There's got to be some kind of intention or something. 
And uh, so I had them do this guided meditation where first I just started them off in their bathroom. I said, do you see your toothbrush? Do you see your toothpaste? Do you see your towel? Because some people just can't see things in their mind's eye, but they did. And and then I guided them all the way and pretending like they were in a castle in Scotland and they walked upon a big fireplace. And I had them like really look at what they were seeing in their mind's eye. So we came out of this visualization. I said, okay, so we are going to collaborate together, all three of us, and see what happens. And so we built this fireplace, and it was so interesting. It was really, really different. And it was different than anything I had ever built on my own. And so um, Robbie came back into town, and he was just in awe. Like, he really, really loved it. And we were so happy that he loved it because it was a labor of love, and it was heavy, and we had to bring in some heavy pieces for the hearth and for the mantle, um, and actually rolled in pieces on metal pipes. And uh, there was a guy working there doing a lot of handiwork uh, named Joel, who was very sweet, and he helped us. Uh, because of my hand and my injury, it was kind of hard, but he helped us get some of that stuff in too. And so that job was um, was a very uh, fun, interesting, and that's that's what makes it worth it. You know, when you can have something like that and see it to fruition, just a vision like that, and uh, and then the accolades that come from it. And of course, getting getting paid is important too. But uh, but just pleasing somebody in that way with your vision is just really really cool. And so with that, you know, life had really taken a turn for me in January and February of 2022, and I was just really uh, feeling like. Finally, I had manifested a happily ever after, and finally I had manifested the kind of life that I truly, truly wanted. It was like, my dreams are coming true, and I'm going to get to travel, and I'm going to get to leave this this labor lifestyle behind and I'm not saying I'm going to quit working because I knew that I was I know I'm going to continue to work uh, but I felt like I was going to be able to at least start you know kind of um, narrowing it down on the type of work I would do and and be able to choose that more literally And with more intention than just taking every job that came down the pike because it was such a survival thing. And I'd really been working hard to save money and to try to get ahead. And I'd gotten myself completely out of debt. And I was now at a, you know, excellent credit rating and things were really changing for me. And I'd worked so hard. I'd worked so hard to achieve that. And it wasn't something that I was just like, you know, really going at it. It was coming to me and I was creating it on a daily basis. And I was suiting up and showing up no matter what. And with all of that happening, I just felt like I was at the top of my game, you know, physically, spiritually, mentally and emotionally. Um, I was eating healthy. I was green juicing it. I was exercising. I'd gone back to yoga. I was doing my rowing machine. I was meditating 15, 20 minutes every morning, no matter what. And I was eagerly going out into my day. You know, this whole relationship with Helen of Greece had given me a whole new outlook on life because I finally felt like there was someone on this planet. I couldn't believe it. There was a person in the universe who was actually getting me, you know, and and for the first time, really, that really got it. And it was just amazing to me. And I was getting, I, I felt like I was getting her, you know, and, and so um, one day uh, we were at the rock yard, Wilkes and I, and I was having to get a bunch of boulders and 
and Helen text, what are you doing right this second? And it was the game that we would play. And I text her a picture of the boulders in the back of my truck. And she said, that one looks like a crocodile head. And it did. It was this huge boulder. And we were going to make a birdbath bowl out of it. And it did look like a crocodile head. And I said, that's really observant. But then she said, is that a Toyota Tundra? And I have, you know, a new Tundra. And I go, yes. And she says, those are really great trucks. And I said, how do you know about a Tundra? I was kind of laughing, like, you know, most A lot of women don't pay attention to vehicles, and I mean, I do, but, you know, and she said, uh, I love Toyota Tundras. I had one, and I go, you had a Tundra? And she said, yeah, that she had had a 2013, and uh, she says, you don't know that about me, but I'm a car girl, and I'm like, you are, and she says, oh, yes, I love Jaguar, BMW, you know, she was like listing all her vehicles that she liked, and um And I said, you just went, I said, Helen agrees. I said, you just went from DCT, which stands for dream come true, to dream of a lifetime. I said, I have never, ever been with a a person that valued vehicles like I do. And I told her about my, my 280Z that I, of course, crashed. And I told her about my old 1972 Land Cruiser, the Toyota Land Cruiser that was like a Jeep. And I sent her a couple of pictures. I pulled up the pictures I had of those cars and sent them. And, uh, and it was really fun to talk about vehicles. And we talked back and forth about vehicles for like 45 minutes, you know, and that was really, it was just so much fun to, um, to be on that page with her. And so my life was unfolding in a way that I was so eager to talk about, but I was still guarded to tell anyone about this experience. And you know how it is, like if you're in love or you have this happening, a lot of times you start telling people and then they get all weird, like, especially if it's gay, like straight people don't want to hear about gay love stories. I think it kind of flips them out a little bit or maybe they just take it too far in their head. I don't know. But of course, if it's a male and a female, they tell their love story. Everybody's, oh, it's such a beautiful story. Oh, my God. But I've always kind of held back on telling my my love affairs or my my love story because of that judgment or that who gross i've just had a lot of rejection in my life around that and um or also it's it seems a lot of times discounted or uh minimized it never felt like it counted like it does in the heterosexual world and that's just my experience I'm older. There are people that have these new experiences and new gay whatever relationships um, that are valued by their family. I mean, hell, I went to a gay wedding and the one of the girl's dads was the, the minister and he's the one that did the service. And I'm like, damn. You know, so, I mean, times have changed. Um, but I think, you know, Helen and I were very cautious about sharing our lives with our families you know she had had dipped the toe in very uh gently with her mom and her daughter uh and her sister but she was sharing bits and pieces and the same with me i hadn't told anybody in my family and i had only told a few friends you know i i I just felt very guarded like i just didn't want to open it up yet because Mainly, I just don't want to hear criticism. And I learned, you know, Joyce Reynolds taught me years ago. She used to say, if you have an idea or a plan or a vision or anything like that, she said, you know, keep it to yourself. Not, you know, just just you hold on to that and you keep manifesting that and you but you don't have to tell the whole world about it because that's when people will feed you the seeds of doubt and they do you know, throw in their devil's advocate comments and their peanut gallery. 
And so I think that's one reason I was so hesitant to share this uh, love story. And then I felt very compelled to to talk about it uh, in this platform through this podcast and through these recordings because it was very, very powerful and very, very moving to me. And, uh, and I was just in a state of awe. I was in one of the most um, fulfilling, happy places that I had been in in my entire life. And I felt like, you know, Jill Haney, you deserve it. You really deserve to be happy. And and I did have a, a friend uh, that I told, and she said to me, you deserve to be happy. And I said, I, I do. I do feel like I deserve that. You know, through all of it, through all the pain and all the nightmares and all the chaos and all that destruction, which I created every bit of it. You know, uh, I felt like I had done some work to get to a place to where I could have a life now that was going to be satis. It was going to be a satisfying life. And I think that's what we're all ultimately searching for is some type of satisfaction, you know, but it's my job each day to control my mood and learn how to get out in front of that negativity and learn how to get out in front of that, uh, you know, that that downtrodden chemical imbalance or whatever the fuck we've got. I've got I mean, I I have to really work at it through exercise and meditation and writing and journaling and praying and God dang, it's a lot of work, but it, but it does pay off, and uh, and this was pure evidence that something was in the air, and something was coming to fruition, and something was finally paying off in Jill Haney's life. Hammered is recorded and produced in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. It's narrated by Jill Haney, produced by Maggie Briggs and Jill Haney, and with sound design, editing, and music by Alexander Rodriguez. Our beautiful artwork was created by Lauren Caddick, and we'd like to send a special thanks out there to Minnie and Robin. You can check out our website, podcasthammer.com, and follow us on social media for updates. <laughs>